Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the uh, weekly meeting of the Motor Club of Harleysville. Uh, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now the four-way test of all the things we say and do. Is it, is it truth, 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 fairness, is it all concerned, will build, build goodwill and better friendships, will be beneficial to all concerned. Invocation this morning will be from Marcia. Okay, this is just a, I found this on the internet, it's a pagan blessing. Okay, blessed be the earth for giving birth to this food. Blessed be the sun for nourishing it. Blessed be the wind for carrying its seed. Blessed be the rain for quenching its thirst. Blessed be the hands that help to grow this food to bring it to our tables, to nourish our minds, bodies, and spirits. Blessed be our friends, our family, and our loved ones. Blessed be. Thank you, Marcia. <clears throat> um, before we get started on our calendar, is there anything that anyone wants to make sure that we include in our agenda today if they've had a look at the agenda if there's anything different they want to make sure that we add or cover well we've got a busy fall coming up as we've talked about in the past few weeks um on the 12th uh the 4-h fair is coming up and that friday the 12th we will be doing parking um and uh we'll be circulating a sign up sheet for that uh and uh for those who haven't had the opportunity to sign up, we will give you another opportunity to do so. Oh, okay. Thank you, Dean. Oh, thank you. Uh, is there any particular times of day that look like need particular attention? Early? Um, the next day, uh, on the 13th, um, we talked about a joint project potentially with North Penn Rotary uh, for the Garden of Health. Uh, Chuck, I think you the one that brought that up last week. What's that? The, the Garden of Health on the 13th. Yeah, we have a work day, right? Yes. The 13th uh, Carol, you want to talk, uh, talk yeah. a little bit about that? So the, the second Saturday of each month is a work day out at Garden of Health for starting. Next, starting August, um, North Penn Rotary is also going to attempt to get people out there. They want to work with us, with Garden of Health, um, and see if we can do the drugs that they want. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, 9 to 11. I'm sorry, what time? 9 to 11. 9 to 11, and that's on Saturday the 13th. So, more oars in the water is what we need. Okay. Yes. Uh, at the end of the month, we have the golf outing coming up. Um, Lon, do you have an update for the golf outing? Sure do. Sorry for tired. How's that? I'm going to pass around the uh, raffle basket list. We're well on our way on that, so thanks for everybody piping in on that. Um, I did start uh, our volunteer sign up list for the day of the event, um, so please look at that. And if you're able to be there to help us uh, get things set up uh, and throughout the day, uh, you can sign up for that. That would be very helpful. And here's brochures for the golf, golfers. How many golfers do you have so far? I'm waiting for Carol's assistant. She just got back from vacation uh, on the back end of Earth to learn the golf website. So, should have by next month. Yeah, I would definitely have by next month. Yeah. It was very often on the party anyway. She's catching up on everything. So. I would assume we have plenty of room for golfers. Yes, we still have plenty of room for golfers. Do you know if we got in touch with the gentleman who um, from Univest who came to speak with us who said he was interested in golfing? Do yeah. you remember his name? I don't remember his name, but I'm going to say no. Okay. Do so you remember who that or have his card? 
when he spoke, he works at the Univest branch over at Skipback, I think, and he said he would definitely golf if we were looking for golfers because he loves golfing. So I have to go back in the uh, Dr. Peabody's Wayback Machine and look his name up on it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lon. Uh, Gary's not here today, but if there's anyone here from the Croquet Committee who wants to talk about how things are going with the Croquet Tournament. Okay, no? Okay. And uh, then, of course, we have the Halloween uh, Parade and Family Fun Fest coming up in October. So. Uh, October, excuse me, August, September, and October are going to be really busy for us, and then we'll have a nice break for the holidays. Um, Gene, do you have an update for the Fun Fest or anything to say about that? No, we're having a Zoom meeting uh, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, okay. And that's at what time? Eight, I think? Seven? Seven thirty. Seven thirty, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't look at the, I looked at your email, but I didn't notice, was there a Zoom on there? Will that be coming up? <laughs> um, any other comments or questions or anything about upcoming um, events or activities uh, these next few months or weeks? Okay, with that, uh, we're going to start with our uh, today's program. Our speaker today uh, is uh, Terry Durstein uh, from Sweatshirt of Hope. He's going to give us a great presentation about uh, his program, and it looks like he brought some uh, signs for us for an upcoming event uh, for us to help him to uh, promote an event that he has coming up in September. Uh, Terry? <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Yes, sir. Here. Uh, Tripping hazards. Good morning. Uh, I'm sure some of you know my story, but uh, for those who don't, I will share a little bit of my journey and what's coming up in September. My wife and I grew up here in the community, going to school together for all 12 years, but never dated until we were out of school. We ended up getting married and several, several, year, several years later had a son, and two years later we had a daughter and life was good. Life changed when our daughter turned 15. She started to experience headaches and then migraines. She visited doctors and all they would do is prescribe oxycodone. At the age of 18, she was admitted to a Philadelphia hospital that specialized in migraines. And after a week of many tests, diet changes, brain scans, we heard the words, we are not able to help your daughter. This was devastating. Doctors prescribed more oxycodone like their M&Ms because back 30 years ago, no one was supposed to struggle with pain. Put the mic down a little bit. Sure. Be able to pick it up a little better. Thank you. She started to run with the wrong crowd and had a first child at the age of 20. At the age of 22, she was addicted to legal drugs, and at the age of 29, she was introduced to heroin. Poor choice, but the pain was intolerable. Life was a roller coaster. Our daughter went to hospital ERs four to five times a week, and doctors gave her pretty much what she asked for. 14 years later, she had her second child, who was addicted when she was born. We raised her first child, and the second child was adopted by friends from church, and today she's doing amazingly well. Our daughter has been in and out of 70 plus rehabs and recovery centers. Today she is 50 years old and still struggling. We are not sure if she's using drugs at this time. Uh, we just don't know. We, have, we do know that she does not have a permanent address, but we have not seen her in over three years. She doesn't live in the Bethlehem area. With all that said, my wife and I struggled living a life of lies due to shame, guilt, and pride. When people asked how we were doing, the answer was always, we're doing great. Being naive and prideful, we did not know where to go for help, so we did nothing. We finally told our pastor he had prayer for us and our family the following week at church, and we were the first family to admit in our church that our daughter was a drug addict, and that was painful to admit. In 2013, the Lord gave me a clear vision on a cold, snowy Thanksgiving morning. All, all I could see was our, while I was laying in bed was our daughter sitting on the front porch steps with her head hood up and zoned out. I sat down that day and in a matter of a few hours, put the vision on paper. I said, Lord, I am not able to answer your call because I don't have the time, I don't have the money, and I don't like to speak in front of a group. God calls us to things we don't want to do. Here I am speaking in front of you. 
I put the paper away, but the Lord kept the vision top of mind. I finally called a friend of mine and shared the vision God gave me. He read it and said, what are you going to do about it? I said, I can't do this. I don't have the time, I don't have the money, and I don't like to speak up front. He prayed with me and I left. For the next four or five months, he kept gently poking me and asking, what are you going to do about the vision God gave you? Finally, after some time, I finalized the logo, printed 94 sweatshirts with the word, hope God loves you, to get the friend off my back. Since 2014, we've impacted over 3,500 people by giving away sweatshirts with the words of encouragement that they are loved, no matter what the situation they're in. In 2018, God gave me another vision to offer nonprofit resources to start conversations in the non-threatening environment. I met with law enforcement, nonprofit organizations, churches, and business leaders in our community to brainstorm. From there, I built a small team to dream about hosting an all-day free Hope Festival in 2019. This was a four-hour event with four police departments supporting us, 40-plus nonprofit organizations, and many businesses. We had 1,000-plus people from four states enjoying free food, concerts, speakers, speakers sharing their testimonies who live in the pits of hell to find a hope in Jesus. 2020, in the midst of COVID, we held our second four-hour Hope Festival with 700 attendees, nonprofit organizations, local police, testimonies, and live concerts. This year we gave away, in 2020, we gave away 1,400 boxes of food and held a job fair because of COVID. 2021 was, while still dealing with COVID, we felt people needed support. So we hosted a four day, six event Hope Festival right next to the Franconia Heritage. This was a challenge for sure. Chief Randy Floyd and I both had COVID that weekend. And which taught us a lot about the way we managed our event. Estimates were we had between two and three thousand people attend. We gave out food boxes again and held another job fair. Now we are in the midst of planning Hope 22. Our event will be held Friday evening from 5:30 to 9, and at September 16th, and all day Saturday, September 17th, with a church service Sunday morning, Hope hosted by Christian Street Missions. This is a huge undertaking because everything is free. We want to offer an event everyone can attend no matter their financial status. Three things we need from everyone is prayer, donations, and volunteers. Our budget is $100,000 and we still need approximately 40,000. We are setting up a thousand seat tent in a 23 acre field across from Jesse's Barbecue. And I do have some brochures and, and schedule and um, some sweatshirts over so you can see what we're doing. Uh, just give you a little bit of an overview of what the schedule is. Friday evening from 5.30 to 9, we have fresh made donuts and organizations coming out of Virginia to do that. Uh, we have hot dogs, hamburgers, churros, ice cream, and beverages. We'll have the life band, um, and we'll hear life changing stories from uh, people that really have been struggling over the years. Evening concert uh, by the three Heath brothers, and uh, we have our keynote speaker is how does Jesus transform a whiskey drinking, pot smoking, heavy metal headbanger into a full time missionary and pastor for 32 years? He says, Come out here. <laughs> it's an ma amazing story. Uh, and then Saturday morning at nine o'clock, uh, we partner with St. Luke's University Health and Penn Foundation to do a recovery walk. It's called Recovery. <coughs> recovery is for everyone. Everybody's struggling with something. If it's discontentment, it's anger. Uh, pornography, uh, addiction, whatever it is, but so everybody's struggling. So um, Randy is in the process of trying to close County Line Road so we can walk from the property down the middle to the middle of Telford and, and return. When we get back, uh, we will kick off our Hope, Hope uh, 22 Festival um, with uh, fresh made donuts. Uh, North Penn Good will be there serving coffee. And uh, then we'll have a local, local band. It is written worship band from Teen Challenge. Uh, they will be opening up for us. And uh, we have uh, Revivals is having a block party with Kite Festival. And uh, we'll have great resources. Right now, we have 60 plus nonprofits that will be there sharing resources. So that's where my wife and I really struggled. We didn't know where to go. We didn't know anything about drugs or anything. And if we did go to Penn Foundation, who would see us when we walked in? So here you can go to a table. It's Penn Foundation, it's Teen Challenge, whatever, whoever it is, or for autism. You go to a table and you can get some resources. You can talk if you don't like what you hear, you can walk away. You go to a, a nonprofit, 
you go to Penn Foundation, you pay a lot of money to go in, you sit there, get beat up for a while because we didn't know what we were doing. So, so it's, they were good to us, but it was just hard in the beginning. Uh, another resource, we have a couple of international resources, Hope for Justice, which is um, Natalie Grant started that and it's for sex trafficking. It's mostly in the in Europe right now, but they are starting in a few cities here. They'll be here and they'll have an investigator sharing how your kids are being groomed uh, on TikTok in their bedrooms at night. And he, he's a, a guy that actually goes out onto the streets and he will be sharing some of those stories how uh, sex trafficking is, is getting bigger and bigger all the time. And from what I understand from one of the police officers that uh, Impression Mall is one of the biggest sex trafficking hubs in the United States, which I didn't know that. We have another one, Save One, and that is an organization that helps women and men deal with abortions. Like uh, we got hooked up with this organization because there was a man that kind of forced his girlfriend to have an abortion, and he lives with that struggle all the time. So he's being helped through them to heal through the things. We will have free haircuts by Modern Male Barbershop for a number of hours. And for women that lost their hair due to cancer, we'll have wig fitting as well. And we'll have food again all day long and um, have stories, life changing stories. And I think it's one or one thirty. We'll have Ryan and friends. He's a uh, man that travels the world. Uh, he'll be doing his thing. In the evening, we have a recording artist, Leanna Crawford, uh, and then a uh, keynote speaker again by Chris Boris. So, yeah, so. One of our main things right now is linking hope for life, linking the nonprofits, the churches, the business community, and first responders. Too many times we work in our own bubbles, our own, you know, in our own silos. So we're trying trying to bring people together. So we're, quite, we're working on that. We're not quite sure how that's all going to work yet, but that's where we're at right now. And um, appreciate your time. Pick up some signs on the way out. I have some flyers over here to schedule and volunteer sign up and a couple of samples of sweatshirts, you can see what we're doing. So I'll hold one up here. Does anybody have any questions? Terry? Yes. For an organization like our organization, like Rotary, what are, what are ways that we can support you? Um, financially, if you're into that, but you can also help us with uh, volunteers. I have a volunteer sign up, an online volunteer. Uh, yeah, so just come out and invite your friends, invite your neighbors, families. There's so many people that are struggling silently. And I think that's one of my my biggest things that the first time our pastor shared it in our church that we were struggling. Five people came up to us after, and that's in church. Five people came up and they were struggling silently. And one girl just was, one lady was afraid to tell her husband she was on depression medication. She said, I'm not sure how he's going to react. So I think, you know, people struggle silently and you know, we lived the life of lies for a number of years, my wife and I just kind of didn't want anybody to know other than our family and, and a few of our friends. So I think there's people struggling every day. And how do, how do we help? Them? So I think that's that's one of my biggest challenges. Yes, I think since since the pandemic started, that's that's blown up too. I mean, there's so many more people that have had, you know, uh, spouse abuse, you know, because they're they're quarantined, they're in home. Right. You know, they couldn't get out to work. They couldn't get away. And uh, I think, you know, gambling has blown up too. Uh, there's so many addictions mm -hmm. out there that uh, people relied on just to just to survive during right. the quarantine. Well, I think the first year, uh, 2020, when we gave, started giving out food, Emmanuel Luther managed that for us. I think we gave out over 1,400 boxes of food the first year. Yeah. People are struggling. They have a choice to either pay their rent, pay prescriptions, or pay, get food. So we gave them food out. So, so I think there's, and people are ashamed of, to ask for help because I mean, we all struggle. It's probably, I mean, that's where my wife and I really struggled. We, we uh, didn't want anybody to know. So who's going to see us when we go try to get help? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. <coughs> Two major sponsors to put on all this food and tents and all that. Well, Bergie, Bergie's uh, car dealership is our one of our main sponsors in Clemens Food. Those are the two main sponsors. We have a lot of other smaller sponsors, but those are our two main. So the prop comes from us and from the yes. Daniel Church. So we bring up the produce from a farm in Maryland. Um, so we get a tractor and trailer from them. But then we go to the yard there, come back to us, and we distribute out to all of our partners. Um, we actually are getting that tractor trailer every two or three weeks. We got our first tractor trailer last week. 18,000 pounds came up on that tractor trailer. Um, this farm, all they do is grow to donate. 
And then Emmanuel Church, um, typically for that, they buy, um, boxes they buy. They get from Blessings of Hope. Blessings of Hope. So they don't buy boxes from Blessings of Hope. They pay, if I'm not mistaken, the price could have gone up, but it's $7 a box that they pay. Um, and those boxes will have, um, they, they really don't know what's in them until they get them and they open them. And then um, all the food that remains eggs. And then um, usually they can get um, meat from ladies or some of those stuff. Yeah, so I think we just need to come together as a community and help each other. I mean, there, there's a lot of people that are hurting. People lose their jobs. And with the uh, inflation, some people are laying, starting to lay people off in, in businesses. So I think we just need to support each other. But we have to be open. We have to be vulnerable. And I think that's the challenge. Yes, Randy. Yeah, I just want to mention, I know that's a busy weekend for us because of the uh, uh, croquet event on the 17th. But if uh, this is a, a very worthwhile event, um, and I've been happy to help with it in the last couple of years. And um, if you can uh, carve some time out on Friday or Saturday night or Sunday morning, um, um, you know, uh, please try to because it's a, it's a great, great opportunity. And, a great right. and Randy's been a big advocate for us. Now we have this year we have four police departments. The first. Uh, three years, but now this year we have we're in Hilltown Township, so we have Hilltown Department, so we have five police departments that are involved. That's really exciting to, to know that they're willing to step up, and, but they they see what's going on every day, much more than we do. Anything else? All righty, thank, thank you. You bet. Thank you. Running a little bit ahead of schedule, so <clears throat> I'm going to give you guys a quick trip to Africa. <clears throat> so, um, just a quick back. Oh, uh -oh. And we saw the final answer there. <laughs> Sorry, we saw the right answer. Right? <laughs> Just some quick background on this. Uh, so my wife went to Penn State. She was uh, a little sister in a fraternity. And she became very good friends with a group of people up there. And they stayed very good friends after they got out of college. So a group of the guys in the fraternity uh, started, when they graduated from college, they started an investment fund for travel and decided that when their last child graduated from college, they would start planning trips and go on uh, group trips. We're not in the fun, but they invite us to go along to see went to school with them and we're friends with them. So this past a uh, couple weeks ago, we went on a big trip to Africa and we had 14 people. Uh, we went for, I think we were seven days. We uh, flew uh, through um, uh, Heathrow to Nairobi and we were in uh, Kenya. <clears throat> so the first day when we were in Nairobi, we uh, before we were flying out to the first camp that we went to, we toured around Nairobi a little bit and went to a couple places in, uh, in, the, in and around the city. The first place we went to was a giraffe preserve. Now, if you've not heard about Giraffe Manor, you can look it up. <clears throat> this um, kind of English looking estate building in the back, you can stay in there. It's like a hotel. And they had these huge windows that they leave open. So when you're sitting in there in a uh, kind of bed and breakfast style, having breakfast, the giraffes actually stick their heads in the window, uh, right in the in the place. So they have a platform there where you can walk around. They give you these kind of half carved out uh, uh, coconuts full of treats, and the giraffes come right up and you feed them. <clears throat> Uh, the next place we went to is um, the Sheldrick um, Elephant 
preserve. Now, what they this place does this is a nonprofit that they take orphaned elephants, bring them this to this preserve, and eventually uh, they're going to reintroduce them to the wild. So when they take them back out into the wild, they let the elephants go out. Sometimes the elephants come back. They might go out again and come back, but eventually. They're, ideally, what these baby elephants are going to do is they're going to connect with another group and be uh, welcomed into another uh, group of elephants, into a family. <coughs> so we had the opportunity um, for our group to ha uh, go and visit. They bring them down, they feed them, uh, which is funny. You know, they all come trotting down in a line. All the uh, people that work there have these big giant baby bottles and they feed them the formula. And then we had the opportunity to just kind of mingle around with them and walk around them and pet them. That was me and my wife. So then when we're done that, uh, we're ready to fly out to our first camp. Uh, we had two uh, planes, we split into groups. It was kind of funny, you know, one spouse on one plane, one spouse on the other, just in case. But, uh, <laughs> but you're, you're flying on a, off of a, a dirt strip like this and they do have people whose job it is to uh, patrol up and down the side of the airstrip. They carry this giant wooden stick in case an animal comes near the airstrip to kind of prod them out of the way. Because one day when we were taking off, there was a giraffe like standing right there on the side of the road. <clears throat> so, uh, I kept that for dust and for um, in the mornings it was cool. Typically during the day, it was quite, you know, it's quite warm. We all wear long sleeves just to protect, protect ourselves from the sun. Very arid, very dry. Um, and I think we're about a mile above sea level. So it was, you know, we're taking, you got all these shots and you're taking all these medications, but I might've saw like maybe three flies while I was there. We didn't have any problems with bugs or anything. <clears throat> so the first day when, uh, we got to the camp, the guides, you know, put us in the trucks and they drive, they're driving us out to the camp and you start to see animals like right away. So the first place we went to was a preserve. So it was what they do there is they're trying to protect um, primarily rhinos at this uh, preserve. And it's many, uh, there's two different kinds of giraffes. I don't know if I have another picture of one, but um, the typical giraffe you'll see has the stripes going all the way around the bottom. The other type has a white belly. And they commingle, so you kind of see them mixed together around, uh, and a lot of other kinds of animals. I think the next picture is. Aren't those zebras? Yeah. That's an hmm? interesting giraffe. That's an interesting I'm giraffe. sorry, did I see giraffe? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Zebras, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Lots of uh, Cape buffalo. Uh, these are uh, males, you can tell from what I learned, is the horns come together. Females are a little bit spread apart at the time. And while we're at the camp, um, a group of, from the tribe uh, nearby came out and uh, came out and sang and did some performances and uh, you know, got our group involved. Uh, so that was really interesting just to hear them, the way they vocalize. Um, <clears throat> they kind of vocalize deep out of their throat. Everyone, it sounded like everyone had a different note. So it was very harmonious. And it was kind of, it was like a choir. I mean, the group of them vocalizing together in a very unique sound. And uh, <clears throat> saw lots of rhinos. So this is um, uh, another thing I learned about rhinos. Is, so this is a white rhino. The way you can tell is the mouth is kind of straight across. White rhinos graze pretty much all day. Black rhinos have a little bit more of a pointed mouth and they go from like tree to tree to feed where uh, white rhinos just, just kind of graze around all day. Uh, so a cheetah, it was interesting about that. Um, this animal, we, when you're you, in the preserve, they have dirt roads and you drive around, but when you see an animal, they just go off road and drive right up to it. And this cheetah just kind of sat there. We had three trucks right around it, just sitting there watching it. He wasn't even paying a bit of attention to us, like we weren't even there. <clears throat> um, a group of us did go on a small hike one day. And uh, so we had a guide with us and a ranger. So the ranger's job is to patrol the preserve um, for poachers. And this guy's carrying a, it's a 458 caliber rifle. So he can take down the big stuff if necessary. 
The only thing he would really need to shoot might be a Cape Buffalo because there's something that might charge you. Um, we did see a black rhino. They have a little bit more of an attitude, but basically he walked towards it, clapped his hands and it ran away. That's typically what they will do. If they really need to shoot, they might shoot in the air, but they rarely have to shoot directly to take an animal there. But it was a big gun. There's another nice shot of a, uh, this might be a black rhino. You can kind of see the point of this look down there. But you can see how close we get to the animals because we're taking these pictures from our, primarily off our phones because uh, that's what most people were using. My wife has a newer iPhone, so she was able to take some great pictures. So in the middle of the day, out in the middle of nowhere in the Savannah, the uh, people from the camp will set up breakfast because you get up before dawn, uh, you go out in the trucks and you're doing your morning safari and then you have breakfast. So they set up these tables, you, they, you know, they got all the silverware and plates, and really nice yogurt uh, cups and uh, mimosas and tablecloths. And in the background, there's a guy actually cooking food. And this is out, I mean, this is like the only tree out in the middle of the savannah. We just happen to be underneath it. And that's the kind of thing that they do. And then you go back to camp, uh, have lunch, take a nap, and then you go out again. Maybe. So we saw um, two lines that were in the process of mating. <laughs> so I'm not going to show you the video of that. Uh, but, um, Lions mate like for five to six days when they're in when they're mating, and they they don't eat. They stay together. There's another male lion nearby that makes sure that no one's going to come around and interrupt them. And the actual mating part takes place like every fifteen to twenty minutes. So, the, what I kind of thought was funny was when you know when the mating part was done, she just kind of flopped over and went back to sleep. <laughs> but um, we, I mean, we're fairly close, like maybe 15 yards from them. And um, when they see a vehicle, they really just see a big kind of shape. They don't really see you sitting in the back of the vehicle. And one of the guides said to us was, that'll change if you step one foot on the ground and they'll be on you in like a second. So they can be very quick. Uh, lots of elephants and baby elephants, and um, again, the first camp we were in had an electric fence around it. So you could see there's like a three-year drought going on there. It's very dry. The grass is very low. Inside the electric fence of our camp, there's a lot of really nice greenery. So what the elephants have learned is, and we hear this in the middle of the night when you're trying to sleep, if they push a tree over the electric fence, they can just walk right in and have themselves a nice meal. No so you hear this large cracking of a tree being pushed over, and then you hear munch, munch, munch right outside your tent. Um, <clears throat> towards the end of the day, um, they'd always drive us to a high point somewhere uh, to watch the sun go down and set up this elaborate, you know, they have snacks, all kind of, they set up the whole bar, they have coolers for beer. Oh, I thought and, that was nitroglycerin. No. Gin and tonics were the uh, gin and tonic and beer were the big things over there. Um, so, but they, yeah, the, all these cool boxes that had like everything. You know, they make this really nice setup with food and stuff. You don't drink the water over there, I guess. Uh, you can, you yeah. Can. I, you know, at the camps, you know, tourism was their biggest, one of their biggest industries <laughs> over there to help raise funds for the preserve and so forth. So, at the camp, you know, obviously they have to be very careful about the food that they serve and the uh, water that they provide for you to drink. So in order for tourists not to get sick, I think they're very careful about that. Yeah. This is a hyena. Uh, crazy thing about hyenas, they're really kind of nasty. They don't kill an animal and then eat it. They kind of just tear it apart while it's still uh, alive. And they're kind of nasty. And obviously they do it as, as a as a pack. Um, but when you see them lounging around like this, they're kind of like a dog. You know, they roll over, they're scratching their ears, or they're wagging their tails and stuff like that. Yeah. So this is us flying from one place to the other. Um, I had the opportunity to sit up front with the pilot, which was fun, to watch the navigation and everything. And of course, you're looking out the window at everything that you can see below. So here's the dirt roads I'm talking about. 
But when you get to crossing a creek or a stream, there's really not a road or anything like that. You're just driving over whatever there in the boulder. So you really have to hang on because these things are rocking and rolling all over the place. And a lot of times there's hippos in the water and what you might not see are crocodiles. And uh, these are manual transmissions. So these guys are like the masters of clutching and breaking. It's pretty amazing. This is the second camp that we were at. So this is kind of like a porch of the main uh, camp type area. So back down in here, this is all full of hippopotamus. Uh, in the front here, there's a couple of big crocodiles that occasionally you'd see a giraffe walking across. During the uh, migration, that, uh, back behind here, right across there, it'd be uh, thousands and thousands of wildebeest. It's kind of permanent along there. And apparently when the wildebeest come through, they mow everything down. And apparently there's lots of flies because wildebeest, I guess maybe because of the dung, uh, there's lots and lots of flies. So this, uh, I had another video of this, which I'm not going to show you while you're eating breakfast, but this is a lion eating uh, Cape Buffalo. So <clears throat> um, what's amazing to see is they, uh, the lions, I guess, field dress the animal. So all the entrails are out. So basically he's sticking his head inside the back there, trying to get the thigh meat from the inside. And you're close enough, you can kind of hear it. Um, and again, we're this close. He doesn't care we're there. He's hungry, that's all. That's all he cares about. Yeah. That's called a topi. And there's many different types of antelopes over there uh, that we saw, all different shapes and sizes. That's a fairly big animal. We saw these other ones called dick dicks, which is like the size of a large cat. They're really tiny, uh, all different kinds. And they're all uh, grazing around together. And it's funny because sometimes if they see a female lion, all of them are looking right at it, paying attention. I forget what this is called, but this is uh, a pr pretty large bird. It's a type of, I think it's a type of um, swan maybe. I think it's, a, it's called a crown something. I forget the exact name. But lots of, many different types of birds and very colorful. And we also saw, I don't know if I have a picture of it in here, it's the second largest bird next to the ostrich, but it's also the largest bird that flies. It doesn't fly a whole lot, but it can fly. This is an elephant that we got fairly close to. You can see uh, it's a big old male. It's got one of those tusks kind of broken off there. Uh, but these, and again, the, the, our truck is like right here. So we're that close to it. And there was, when you see, um, and there was a large group, and there might have been like 12 animals there, uh, including some very small ones. This baby elephant, which was with that group, this was kind of funny to watch because when they're really small like that, now this elephant was probably like up to my knee, it was tiny. They're trying to figure out what their trunk is and what to do with it, because they really don't know. And he's just running around trumpeting with this thing, watching the other elephants eat. And he's not, they're not quite sure what to do with their trunk yet. They're, it's kind of like a baby when they first see their hand. <laughs> uh, we did have an opportunity to go on a hot air balloon excursion. I couldn't imagine that 14 people plus the pilot, but it somehow it fit. It was a huge <laughs> basket. And I'd never been in a hot air balloon before. So, um, it was a little breezy that day, so the way he loaded us in, he had the basket tilted on its side. So we had to climb in sideways, and like uh, there's seats in there, and you're sitting. It's like you're on the space shuttle. You're laying there like this, holding on, and then eventually, when he gets enough air into the uh, balloon, it tilts up, and he just lifts off. And when the the uh, flame is not on, it's just perfectly quiet, and you're just floating. It's really amazing. And then you're looking down and you're seeing all the animals down there. He can, uh, he got, was able to bring us up and bring us down really low, at different altitudes and the landing was very smooth, but uh, was super nice. Interesting thing about him, when he first, after the ride, he's talking to me, he said, oh, I've been here for, you know, I've been here ballooning for like three weeks. We're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> he had uh, just gotten a contract to fly balloons here, but he'd been flying balloons for like over 20 years, like maybe 26 years or something like that. He's from England. <coughs> and apparently there were 
it's kind of a tight group with the balloonist over there, but there was like a Russian guy and a Ukrainian guy, and then uh, they both split, and then there was an opening for another guy to come in. Yeah. Are those other, um, let me think back, are those other hot air balloons in the background I see? I'm sorry, there was, a, there was a number of them in the area that morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I saw any other baskets that were as large as hard yeah. Are they actually... Were you actually leaning around, or is it tethered like a balloon that's So the pilot, you know, off the, like, if you see the circumference of the balloon hanging off the front, he had a GoPro camera, and he had a remote booker on it. So he was able to take pictures of us, and he gave them to us on, like, a little thumb drive afterwards. Yeah. But, I mean, did you actually balloon around the area, or is it just, is it just up and down? down? Oh, no, you're going for a dis pretty good distance, yeah. Wherever the wind takes you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so this is funny at the camp. Uh, this gentleman, Doug, had a birthday. So the camp decided, okay, we're going to play a little joke on Doug. So they bring out the cake. They ask him to cut it. And he's having a really hard time getting through it. And then he finally realized, I mean, it's got icing on it. It's got his name on it and everything. And he gets, gets in there and he realizes it's a big pile of elephant dung. Oh, <laughs> 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 The second camp that we went to did not have a fit. <laughs> so at nighttime, um, a lot of animals, especially hippopotamus, at nighttime hippopotamus come out of the water and they graze. So you would hear animals grazing all around the camp at night. So there were other gentlemen, this gentleman's name was Simba, and there were two other gentlemen uh, from his tribe who patrolled the camp at night, just in case there were anything like maybe a leopard or something that was coming in. And he walked around that spear all night long. Yes. I know when we go camping around here, they always tell you to put your food up. So did you have to put your food away or did you have to hide it or whatever? They did recommend, like if we had like snack bars or yeah. stuff like that, we put them in the main tent. They put them in the kitchen, oh, okay. like in a, in a refrigerator or something like that. But they didn't want you to leave anything in the tent. Yeah. Another thing at this camp, like you, you're, you're in like an actual tent. I mean, it's, it's got a full bathroom and electricity and everything and a king size bed. But, you know, it's got the zip. You know. <laughs> really rough. That's, that's yes. how we can. <laughs> but when you uh, when you leave the tent or when you go to bed at night, you got the three zippers that come together. You had a carabiner, and you're supposed to clip all the zippers together so that the baboons could unzip and come in and uh, help themselves or whatever you had in your tent. Uh, so one day we're out and. Um, one of the tr uh, trucks, three trucks, a uh, female lion came up and laid down right next to it. Um, didn't want to, didn't really care about who was in the truck or about the truck. She was using it as a blind because it was a topi antelope coming across this way. So she was hiding. So she was just waiting there, but uh, very close and uh, making eye contact with people who were leaning over taking pictures of it. Uh, the day we left this last camp, we saw lots of giraffe. We thought it was ironic because we had 14 of us and we saw 14 giraffe. So we thought that was neat. Yeah. And then off to London, we spent a few days in London all the way back. It's cool to see the bridge open. Um, so you can pay um, a fee to get up and walk across here. They have a plexiglass in that walkway over there, which you can stand on and look right down at the bridge, um, which is neat. Uh, and we did a what's called a liquid history tour. So we had a historian uh, tour us around to four different really old pubs from like the late the 1700s. And this particular one um, had a cockfighting ring in it. I mean, this place was tiny. It was about a third of the size of this room. And they would have, uh, it had a balcony where people would sit and look down at the fights. And uh, so that's, back in the day, that's what they had going on in this pub. And uh, so there's my wife learning her. Uh, she's uh, retiring from corporate life, so she's learning a new trade. <laughs> and that's our trip. <laughs> if anyone's interested in doing a group trip or thinking about planning or something like that, I can refer you to the person we planned our trip with. Uh, he came with us for most of the trip. He lives in Australia. Uh, but he was a great guy, uh, very informative, and a lot of fun to be with. And uh, so that was very helpful to organize the trip. Yes, Laura. Uh, 
what what free travel preparations did you do? Uh, mainly, we had to get a couple of shots like typhoid and yellow fever. Uh, and you had to be up to date. I think I had to get hepatitis A also. I had uh, a number of years ago gone to India and gotten a bunch of other shots, so I already had hepatitis B. You take malaria orally while you're there, and they also give you a very heavy, um, uh, in case you get an infection, in case, just in case kind of medicine, but I didn't have to use that. Yeah. Everyone packed modium and pectobismol and stuff like that, but I don't know if any of us ever had to use it. And this time of year seemed like a good time of year to go. Uh, the weather was warm, but not like super hot. And like I said, the, I don't, we really didn't have any experience whatsoever bad with the bugs or anything like that. You know, so one snake, only because someone caught it, brought it into the camp so we could look at it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. The, uh, the tribe uh, people who came and entertained the attack, were they the math side? Yes. Oh, did yeah. they do the jumping? Yes. And only the higher you jump, the more girlfriends you get. <laughs> That's what I am. And it's amazing because they jump, they're jumping like a foot or more off the ground, like repeatedly. They're like just right back up and down. They have very high vertical leap. Yeah, it's amazing to watch. Yeah, yeah. my parents uh, back in 1970. Uh -huh. Did an Africa. It was a group trip uh, to Africa. And that's was the first I heard about them. They yeah. Took pictures, and then we have some friends uh, down in Cape May. They're actually from Poland. They have a couple. Of, they're young, young enough to be our children. Um, they come to Cape May and run their businesses in the summer, go home in the winter, and then they do some vacationing. And so the only place in Poland that they could get to was Zanzibar. And uh -huh. Luckily, some of the Maasai have gone to Zanzibar. <laughs> And doing the same thing, you know, entertaining and things like that. So they've got to see it a couple of times. You know, the, the jumping, jumping yeah. again. Yeah. So yeah our guy, the guy that we plan this tour with, he does tours in other areas of Africa. And one of the ones he does is in the jungle with uh, the gorillas. And there's a gorilla experience where you're like sitting like right next to a gorilla. So that's pretty, sounds pretty neat. Hair <laughs> yeah. Did they talk about is the uh, animal population within the reserves is it going up or going down over years or that situation? You know, um, I don't recall us talking specifically about that, but the main thing at the first camp we went to, I know, was about uh, preserving the rhinos. I know there are less black rhinos than white rhinos, um, and but they, I mean there were lots. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure about the population changes. Yeah. I mean, the biggest challenge they're having is water. I mean, it was severely dry. Um, and um, <coughs> one of the other thing that I learned while I was on the hike about white rhinos. <coughs> white rhinos all will, uh, poop in the same spot. And it's like a communication tool for them because when they come to that spot, they can tell who's been here, and if the rhino walks away from that spot, they can tell which direction that rhino went. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like they're how they know where each other is. Yeah. And I thought that was interesting. They all have, they all have reasons for doing the things they do, which is amazing. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
toothbrush. <laughs> it's the dumbest choice with a 43 cup contoured brush head and ergonomic handle. Ah, uh, but wait, there's more. To complete your experience, we're including a 3.2 fluid ounce bottle of Listerine Cool Mid mouthwash. ADA accepted and helps prevent reduced plaque and gingivitis. Value for today's grand prize. Well, you can't put a value on tooth care unless you have one teeth. Uh, <laughs> one dollar. I, I get it. All right. We, I visited the place in England. You know, you were in, in England where uh, William Addis invented the modern toothbrush. There was no plaque. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Take it from here, Larry. You're going to see that. Today's host selected a runner from our studio audience just moments ago. When it comes to answering questions about rotary and going to the dentist, this Rotarian knows the drill. No. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause to Kyle Sayers. That's what you hoped for this morning. <laughs> We don't know about rotary. What is the initiative? What initiative is the result of Rotary and the Institute for Economics and Peace? Let's see. Rotary Peace Fellowships, Rotary Positive Peace Academy, <laughs> Rotary Peace and Prosperity, Peace Act. Peace Act. <laughs> peace Act. Peace Act. <laughs> Well, what do you think? Now, you do have your lifelines, as always, a 50-50. Ask a friend, and of course, ask the audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where is friend? Ask the audience. Uh, okay, audience. How many think we're talking about Rotary Peace Fellowships? Yeah. How about Rotary Positive Peace Academy? How about the Rotary Positive Peace Academy? Oh, oh yeah, right. okay. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Keep an eye on Jim. He's a man. Jim is a man. No, he's good. Okay, and how about Rotary Peace and Prosperity? Oh, we're there. You can't raise your hand for every question. And how about Peace Act? You're messing it up, Jim. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not even sure what the audience saw. Nobody knows. The only guy that knows is Jim, maybe. Like I said, I think he gave you a really good hint there. Yeah, let me see. I don't know what the answer could be. But no, I, I don't know which it could be. What you said, C, before that. Let's see. Oh, 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 yes. Follow the cues. All right, I'm sorry, I confused the audience. Confused me. Yeah, yeah. What could Look it be? Closely, yes. Yeah. What could it be? Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get rid of some of these incorrect answers here. All right, obviously it wasn't peace out. That wasn't the initiative. Oh, it wasn't uh, there. So we're talking about Rotary Peace Fellowships. Yay! No, we're going to the Rotary Peace Academy. And this is a newer initiative that started in uh, 2018. And a piece of it is, of course, talking about what is positive peace. And I, I, I didn't really grasp this concept. They talk about negative peace, which is sort of the absence of violence and terrorism, homicide, war, and things of that nature. But positive peace is what a lot of what we do is Rotarians. And that's sort of putting the background, the structures, and things in place within a community that prevents and maintains peace. In other words, if you can educate the population, if you can provide an economic uh, assistance, health and things of that nature, they're the items and things that tend to you know, propagate peace, to keep people from going to war and getting sort of off track to that end. So it's sort of an interesting thing. It is in the Rotarian magazine, so you can find out more. There's a little bit more here to go. How can I become a peace builder? And I can actually maybe read it from years. You'll, well, you can go to a site, it's positivepeace.academy, and go there. But anyway, you'll learn effective peace building in your community, understand how to develop stronger, more sustainable programs. You'll hear from global leaders about 
to study a piece. And you can complete a two hour self kind of guided self taught course online. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was an interesting concept, and it is there if you want to know more. It's in this month's Rotarian, so I'll go back. But anyway, Jim, you were right on target. You were the only guy willing to step up. Jim. You could have had the mouth washing the toothpaste. No, there was no toothpaste. Toothbrush, I'm sorry. I, 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 I asked the dentist for some cute things. How about toothpicks? And I got a set of x rays. Thank you and congratulations, Kyle. <laughs> okay. Uh, Brags or Shags? Anybody? Brags or Shags?